Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just waiting for more people to register and we'll be starting shortly. Thank you. Morning everyone, we'll be starting in one minute, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, on a day where we finally got some pretty good rain, uh, which is great. Um, thank you for joining uh, this, the latest in our series of In Conversation With. Uh, for those of you who haven't attended before, uh, what a series of one-on-one -on -one discussions where we interview um, recognized and celebrated individuals who are of direct interest to our members. Uh, on behalf of the CLA, I'm really delighted to uh, welcome you to what I'm sure will be a really informative event. Uh, my name is Mike Valencia, I'm the Regional Director for the South East. Um, so today's discussion brings together our CLA President Mark Bridgman with uh, Minister Victoria Prentice. Uh, she's North Oxfordshire's MP and a farmer's daughter who knows firsthand how important our industry is. Um, she's a passionate environmentalist and supporter of the rural economy, as well as an advocate for tackling the threats faced in these areas. Uh, Minister, welcome. Um, I need to remind everyone, as usual, that today's session is being recorded for future use, uh, including um, availability to our members of our website later. Uh, the format, as ever, is your microphones and uh, videos will be muted throughout the webinar. Um, Mark will have a discussion with Victoria, after which he'll pose questions that uh, you'll ask. So do please feel free to ask questions at any time using the Q&A button, not the chat button, but the Q&A button, and he will attempt to cover as many as possible at the end. Thank you very much. I will now hand you over to Mark and Victoria. Okay, um, Michael, thank you very much for that. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, Minister, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for doing this. I know um, how incredibly busy you are. We've both been having joyous IT um, challenges this morning. I've had to call for students upstairs to help me, which you don't have when your office. And I, I was saying how I'd had seven hours of Zoom and you were saying you had 13 yesterday. So huge sympathy um, because in this strange times, we spend our whole time on this technology. I wondered if we could start off um, just, you're very new to the, new to the role. Um, and it's come at a time with massive change for the industry, probably the biggest change in 50 years. And maybe just give us a little bit of your own personal background and that's, that's relevant um, from, a, from a sort of agricultural point of view. I'm sure you know, our members will be interested to hear that. Um, well, thanks, Mike, and thanks, Mark, and thanks to all of you, really, for coming on this webinar. We are lucky 
that we can meet virtually. It's obviously not nearly as good as meeting in person, but this is considerably better than nothing. It's great to be with you. I was a CLA member, well, we were as, as, as a family for quite a long time, I think about 10 years until we had one of our regular saving money episodes and gave up a number of memberships, I think. Um, but I've always been fond of and close to the CLA. And my old dad, I think it's fair to say, is on this call at the moment as a very long-standing CLA member. He farms um, near Banbury, where we still live. We live a few miles from my dad. And though I personally have never farmed full-time, I am a very keen smallholder. Excellent. And, I mean, you're... You're, you're a lawyer by, by training, so you, you, are, uh, you're, you, you are interested in the detail and there's so much to take on board. How, and you're new to the department with all this change, how, how have you sort of grappled with that? And you know, how do you, where do you turn to for advice to sort of soak up all this information and who, who inspires you, the people you've seen so far? Well, the, I've known the department well for a long time. I, I am a lawyer, I spent 25 years working broadly in the EU human rights world, but broadly for the government, as a government lawyer. So I'm not frightened by legislation. And I, in fact, I do, I do love getting into the details of, of policy formation and how we, how we do that by way of legislation. But I have to say, I've always been close to DEFRA. Um, my dad was a minister in the department. My, my grandfather who I just remember was also a very forward-thinking farmer as many of your members are and there are so many people I go to for advice there are excellent people within the department we have also great links I've got great links to farmers local to me and also my husband's from from Yorkshire from North Yorkshire so we have very close links to Wensleydale as well, where we spend a lot of time. And it's good to see how very different sorts of farming um, can be made to work in the modern world. So I've, even though I um, only smallhold, and I am every proper farmer's worst nightmare, I should think, with my couple of sheep and, and three cows and two beehives, um, I, I do farm cider apples and pears relatively sensibly. Um, I, I, I've always been interested in agricultural policy and certainly when I arrived in Parliament in 2015 probably the greatest shock to me among my peers was how far from the land they were mm -hmm. and that certainly made me feel I had to get more involved in the agricultural discussions that are exciting this is a great time for British farming yeah no well thank you well I think it'll be reassuring for our members or anyone listening you know that that, that it's in it's in the it's in your blood in your bones so that you're you have you're close to it maybe if we could move on first just to talk about covid you know you, you came in knowing that you were having to take the agricultural bill through parliament and then suddenly left field comes covid and i know you've been very very involved in uh, as well as the whole department could you just talk through some of what you think early lessons that that you you think are, that that we can learn um, from from what's happened as far as the UK food chain goes, and you know what, how you think um, we need to adapt as a result of what what you've seen so far. Oh, there's so much, and actually, we probably ought to have a whole session on that <laughs> at some point before too long. Yeah. So, I came in um, mid Feb immediately had to take the ag bill through. Um, so very focused on that. Then I got. COVID myself and was sort of averagely ill, but it certainly made, made me struggle for a, a week or so. Well, I wasn't at work. I was, I was sitting in a bed sit in London in, in bed. Um, so that was a challenge. And then I was asked, I was very honoured to be asked to take over the chairmanship of this task force for feeding the vulnerable. So I had to immediately get involved on a very granular level as to how on earth we were going to feed people who we'd asked to stay at home and not go shopping. Um, and that became an, an exercise in learning a great deal about how our supply chains work, how good and resilient, in fact, they are, how the commercial offer has been brilliant and has largely succeeded. Government could, of course, help and did help. We relaxed drivers as we 
a relaxed competition law to enable retailers to work together. Um, there are genuine food heroes. I know it might sound a bit trite to say it, but people have worked blooming hard in our sector to make sure that despite staff shortages and difficulties with distancing and all the rest of it, the food is still available for people who need it. And now, of course, as we've seen in the news this week, we have very difficult challenges for people who are economically vulnerable and who have trouble affording food. So my task force has slightly shifted its focus to try and help them as well. But it has been, um, it has definitely not been an easy time for anybody, not for the industry and not the government. I think our strong and good links in DEFRA at all levels <laughs> with, with supermarket bosses who really have stepped up, if I'm honest, and with, with food producers at, at all levels of the supply chain has been great. We've all learned a great deal about food security and what we really mean by that. Yeah. Um, and yes, we, we, are, we have coped in, in the food sphere. I'm, I'm very proud of us all. And you, you talk about food security and there's been, and it's, it means different things to different people. And I know in the agricultural bill, there's, a, there's a, a, an intention that we'll sort of review it every five years. I know the CLA is called, I know others, it's been come up within the Commons and the Lords that really maybe that, one of the things we might have learned from COVID is that probably need, that should be on an annual basis, that every five years, what we don't want to do is a, every five years write a report and it gather dust in some department. I, well, I think the clause in the bill has been slightly misinterpreted. What it, uh, we haven't reviewed our food security in a formal report sense for a very long time. So five years is a step forward, but what, what that is, is, is not an ambition. It's an, it's an order, if you like. It's a legal obligation to do it at least every five years. I would certainly not anticipate waiting that long after the current pandemic. We clearly want to review what we've done, what we've learned, in short order. And the clause in the bill allows us to do that. It just says it has to be done every five years. We can, of course, choose to do it much more often. But it is going to be quite a detailed report. And some of it relies on data that is produced in a longer period of time than annually. So that's why we put the five-year period in there. I'm not saying at all that we will wait five years to review what's just happened. Of course we won't. And I think we, we have all, I, and I think actually, um, which is a good thing for the industry, the general public has started to think more closely about where their food comes from and what really matters, which I hope we can capitalise on. Yeah, okay. Um, obviously, it's caused disruptions in the food sector and everyone has had to ad adapt to that. But, you know, if we look forward now, you know, there's other possible, dis other possible disruptions. We could have a second spike. Um, you know, pray God we don't. But um, more likely and qu quite possibly, we could um, um, we may we may well depart from the EU without um, the the deep um, um, yeah, trade agreement that we free trade agreement that we would like, and that's definitely got to be a possibility. And we we went to the wire twice before. How is your department starting to prepare for that? And you know, you'll know, you know, there's certain sectors. You know, sheep is obviously the totemic one. That are, that are terribly worried about this and and how can you what planning are you doing and how can you reassure people in those sectors that are going to be most affected by a no deal or what the government would call is an australian deal which in brackets is not not a full free trade deal well the department we, we joke in in slightly black humor way in the department about having now prepared for the abyss as it were well, they, they, they call it four times is, is what they've been stepped up to do. And of course, we have in the last three months dealt with a very real crisis. Um, and there's no other way to describe the pandemic. It has been a crisis of, of the first order. Um, the no deal planning was incredibly useful to not just the department, but the whole food supply chain in coping with COVID, actually. And though none of us would have wished to, we have tested our systems in real time in a real pandemic, um, which has not been fun, but it has broadly worked. I 
and the government, I'm still very hopeful. We're, we're less downbeat than you are, Mark, about whether or not we're going to get an agreement. Hmm. I think we will. I think the fact that President Macron is here today is, is a good sign. These are our friends and neighbours. Yeah. I, they want to trade with us, we want to trade with them. We have, we have links that go very, very deeply. So I am still hopeful that we will get a good free trade agreement. We have, of course, got formally a deal. We're not doing the awful crash that we feared for so much of the last two years. And I'm also pretty confident that the department can weather whatever happens. I'm, I'm not pretending the next 18 months is going to be without bumps in the road because there are bound to be things that we haven't thought about but i think we will manage and as far and i know you look the, the department you know had had some contingency plans last autumn you know for example around lamb because as a you know as i say that's as, as an example um, and presumably, as i say they will be dusted off again um, but at what point would you sort of make that sort of public to farmers because what the, the great risk is that farmers react because they don't know what's coming down the road yeah, yeah. and obviously you you as a department we might not know until the 11th hour if it's like any other European trade deal at what point would you be more open about what might happen if well, we're, we're trying. It is very difficult. I think we've all learned over the last 40 years how European negotiations work and when they happen. Um, and, and I say that as a, as a passionate European for most of my life, really. Um, but it, this isn't ideal for anybody trying to plan a business. I'm afraid there is nothing we can do about it. We are going all guns blazing for a really good free trade agreement. We will continue to do that. I think we'll succeed. I really do. But it might not be till the 10th hour, if not the 11th. Um, we will, we've tried to be as transparent as possible about what we're doing. For example, in the American trade talks, we've published the negotiating strategy in a way that is fairly unusual, actually. So I think you're right to press us for transparency, but again, we don't want to frighten people, which is um, a very difficult balance to strike. So I would encourage your members very hard to get involved in the planning for future farming policy, which we know will happen. Yeah. Um, and I would encourage them to look at the UK global tariffs, which have been published, which ought to be fairly reassuring, much better than, than where we were 18 months ago. Agreed. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen any more than you do. OK, thank you. Well, I'd love to come on to future farming in a second. But before that, well, linked to that, obviously, I think perhaps if we could turn to the, the agricultural bill, which um, um, is, is, is going through Parliament as we speak. And um, just, you know, as far as I suppose a scene setting, because, you know, you've, the, the media is sort of alive to this. You know, the focus of the debate has been both in the Commons and the Lords around standards, in particular, other things as well. Now, there's been this um, petition that's got reached a million, a million um, people about about standards. Jamie Oliver, you know, Jeremy Clarkson all over the weekend press. <laughs> it's got the sort of zeitgeist and it's got some sort of momentum. And, uh, and often these things get lost in sound bites. Um, I just wondered if you could give your view of, of, of where we are. I know the Prime Minister, I, um, the, the Conservative Manifesto, I know you've said, you know, we'll not compromise on our high standards. But somehow it's just that message hasn't sort of doesn't seem to have landed. Um, do you, do you, great opportunity for you just to say what, what your, your view is and or the government's view on, on this, this, this totemic issue about standards and you, you understand what the issue is from our perspective. Um, Mark, I, I thought, that that's a very good way of phrasing the question and and thank you for what you're doing to try and get the public debate into the right place and for the article you wrote recently on Con Home. I, I'm i very frustrated by, uh, well in fact I'm hopping mad if I'm honest, about the way that this is being presented um, by another another farming organisation not, not far from, from us as it were and by the press. I fear that we are in danger of frightening the public unnecessarily. So if it's all right with you, I will completely restate our position. 
Um, I said that at least half of me is a farmer. The other half of me is very much a government lawyer. And it makes me very angry that the message about the legal position is just not penetrating the public consciousness. So in terms of the totemic chlorine washed chicken and hormone treated beef, we have laws which prevent them being imported. Through the Withdrawal Act, we have incorporated those laws into our law here. They cannot, unless we vote in Parliament to change those laws, which I really don't see happening in a month of Sundays, be imported into this country. So our, our standards, if you like, our baseline remains exactly the same. Nothing changes with Brexit in terms of our standards. We've also, on top of that, because we don't just want to be baseline, we want to be high standard farmers in this country. Um, we've got a commitment in the Conservative Manifesto on which every single one of my colleagues stood, including the ministers in the Department of Trade, to say that we will not compromise our food standards, our environmental standards and our animal welfare standards. We mean that. Liz Truss and George Eustis wrote, I thought, a very reassuring letter, which I'd really encourage your members to look at. Um, a few uh, a week or so ago restating our commitment to standards i've heard the prime minister who doesn't often talk about farming say that again and again incredibly clearly i'm afraid this debate is is just not real and it is incredibly annoying that when we ought to be focusing on the most ex exciting changes to british agriculture in probably 70 years, if I'm honest, not just 50 years, um, we're all sidetracked by this ridiculous, false debate about standards. Sorry to be grumpy, but it, it is really annoying. Okay. So, I mean, just one more question. Right? So if you're sitting in America and you're wanting to do a trade deal with the UK, um, and you know we want to do a trade deal with America because there are opportun huge opportunities, um, but at the heart of every single US trade deal has been agriculture and you know even whichever color of uh, political color but most definitely with the current current lot um you know agriculture is sort of you know deeply embedded in in their psyche as far as trade deals um how how does one square square the circle um you know i'm no trade expert but you know i've read stuff in the last few days about you know you you do it through tariffs but then you know, that would be a way of protecting, I suppose, uh, UK um, production, but it doesn't necessarily overcome the problem of, of stuff being produced to different standards. So, or, or does it mean, or does it mean what is a very small part of the economy um, kiboshes a US trade deal? Well, I hope not. We really want a US trade deal and, and not just for other parts of the economy. We want it for our part too. And, uh, uh, producers all over the country are very keen to start um, or continue exporting to the States. I think where we are is we have to start from our regulatory baseline. I'm sounding like a lawyer again, um, but there we are. That is immovable and those are standards below which we will not go and we have chosen not to go through our democratically elected parliament. Um, but on the tariff argument, I think I, I mean, th this isn't yet government policy, but I think there are interesting discussions to be had in the future about if, say, you are an American producer who produces to a higher standard. So, you know, one of the schemes like our red tractor scheme, they have something called the GAP scheme or, or an organic scheme or, or whatever higher standard you wanted to produce to. I can see in the future, this isn't yet our policy, but I, I would definitely like to discuss further the idea of having a lower tariff for those sort of goods. Because our standards that we are very proud of in this country are not things we can export, but we would hope to be able, when importing, to, um, to bring the world, as it were, up to ours rather than go to the lowest common denominator. So I think that doesn't just apply to the American trade deal, that applies to all future trade deals, I hope. We would want to encourage high standards. They are something that our consumer says it's willing to pay for. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, conscious of time, I'd like to move on, if we can, to, to, to the future and future agricultural policy. 
we're, we're, we're moving in this sort of seven year transition um, through, through the Ag Bill and, um, you know, ELMS and all these different schemes that are being developed and worked on. Um, we're going, it, I think transition is, 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 is the big challenge because we know that the lack of profitability in many sectors of, of farming sectors. Um, one of the things that we at the CLA have been calling for in our transition work is that you know, when we start moving away from BPS, um, ELMS won't be available till 20, end of 24. And we've got to be very careful term the sort of valley of death that we don't start taking it out of way, risking businesses or putting businesses at risk that could potentially be viable long term. And so we've called that we shouldn't have more than a 25% cut in that BPS until that the, the new schemes are available. Um, how do you see, um, do, we, do we overcome this issue um, over this next, um, these next few years as we, as, and, you know, before Elms is fully, fully, fully ready? Well, this, this is the big challenge and I would like to reassure your members, it, it's not easy, it's, it's change, it's really big change. Mm. We've been, we've had the comfort blanket, if you like, of the Common Agricultural Policy which passionate European though I was, I would never ever begin to defend, but we have had it as a comfort blanket for a very long, well, for my lifetime really. And it changes scary and it is going to be change in a big way. I think it's good change and I think it's exciting genuinely. And I suspect most farmers are on board with that. Paying people public money for public goods is something that the CLA I know is on board with and completely gets the need to do. But what the Secretary of State and I are so keen to manage is the transition. So it's great. And of course, you know, theorists and agronomists like talking about the high level stuff and the seven year transition and tiers and all the rest of it. But what really matters to those of us who actually farm is what am I going to get next year? What am I going to get the year after? And what scheme are you trying to nudge me into, which will show environmental benefit on my farm? Yep. So I think all I can do is say that George and I are very focused on the granular and very detailed um, schemes that we're going to put forward in the next year or so. So in July, so next month, we will set out what is going to happen next year. There will be some very slight reductions. We've said not more than 5% for 80% of farmers. So, I mean, truthfully, that's within the margin of what we've all learned to cope with anyway, truthfully. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming, but we have not yet decided that money that we recoup in that way will be used in agriculture, in farming, possibly in a COVID recovery or, or other emergency crisis scheme, which is something that the NFU has long called for. And then we will set out in much more detail what we're going to do in 21 to 24 this autumn. So this autumn, you ought to start to be seeing flesh on the bones. But what I would say at this point is that the Secretary of State and I are very keen that the CS and ES and higher level schemes that we have at the moment will be simplified, will seamlessly move into ELMS, so not more form filling, much easier for the farmer on the ground. And we, the, the more we can move people in at the very early stages of the transition, the more environmental benefit we get and the much better it is for the farming industry. So we're looking at ways we're talking about sustainable farming initiatives is the terminology we're using at the moment and we're looking at um things that we hope that all farmers will be able to engage with a sort of menu of options and we want your members to come to our webinars which is starting again next month to send in their responses to the consultation on elms but to keep it as low level as they like practical suggestions about what to do in 18 months time are very, very welcome at the moment. Okay, all right, well, thank you. I certainly think putting some um, detail around that is really important because we know what, and I know you say 80%, but a lot of the sort of, some of the larger scale farmers doesn't necessarily mean they're any more profitable, but that are producing the lion's share of, um, it, it's a much, much, <laughs> much, much bigger percentage. 
um, of BPS that's being talked about. Um, and I think if, if we had, you know, if each individual farmer almost had a statement, like you might get your pension statement or any other statement, this is what you're going to get. Because I think until individuals get something in writing, this is what it's going to look like. This is what the this is what the package is going to look like. I think that will um, really help people. That's something we're actively talking about because, of course, because we have years of BPS data, we have real knowledge of our of our punters, if you like. So that is a discussion that we're having very actively in the department. What it is helpful to tell people when, um, and how to bring people in so far as possible into the new schemes. Good. So please do all get involved. This is very much a live discussion. George and I are determined to make it as farmer friendly and as user friendly as possible. It is change, so yes, I know it's frightening, but it will be good. It will be good, not only in the end, but I hope in the transition. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, certainly in the CLA, we are very involved with various tests and trials, particularly around sustainable farming and a number of, a number of things. So we are engaging. One of the things in the transition that's being talked about, and I know the Secretary of State has talked about this, you know, when he was in your role and now, is this idea around um, a retirement scheme, the ability to sort of take the, when, when the BPS is um, um, un unbundled, that it delinked is the term, um, that maybe that will be capitalised and it will be an opportunity um, for those that want to step back from farming or to maybe to take the funds and invest in some you know, um, productivity improvement. Well, what, what is your view on that and, and when do you think we'll see hear more about that from the department? It's a really awkward conversation to have and I feel awkward having it with, with your members, particularly as my old dad, I fear, is on this call as one of your members. I don't know, but I fear he may be. Now he's 78, sorry dad, and he's a BPS recipient. And of course what we have to remember is that a lot of BPS recipients are in the older age bracket, can I say politely, sorry, I don't want to offend anybody. And one of the very hard conversations to have, everybody on this call will sympathise with this, this very difficult thing I'm about to say, is how to pass on your farm to future generations. It is the elephant in the room. It is something we don't like talking about. Nobody likes talking, well, farmers in particular, really don't like talking about their retirement. But we are very conscious that if we are going to be modern and productive and forward thinking and at the forefront of world agriculture, which I really hope we are, we have to enable people to have those conversations. And the d <laughs> awkward as that may be, and, you know, I'm practically the cold sweat saying this in front of your membership, um, who all of whom will sympathise because they know how difficult it is. But um, if the lump sum can be part of that conversation and part of the solution, then that is absolutely something we've got to tackle. So we're, we're not doing this um, without consultation. We will be consulting on this specific issue later this year and whether lump sums are suitable. But if we can help people into a dignified retirement off their land, where that is appropriate, that is definitely something I'm keen to look at. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, just turning to sort of elms and the, the, the scheme that's gonna be coming forward, um, you, you mentioned CLA, we certainly do sort of buy into the concept of that public funds and public goods and our land management contract that we came up with three years ago, I know has been sort of you know, part of that discussion. Um, how do you see it? Um, you talked about sustainable, sustainable farming. Do you see, it's one of the concerns that some people have is it's just about, um, you know, environmental stuff around around the fringes of a field you know the sort of boggy corner and yes that is important and that's a great opportunity there but it's also about what one can do across the the, the farm and sustainable farming means all sorts of different things but can you see just what what in your view is it what is it is it about the edges is it about the total farm um, is it a bit of both i definitely want to see farms that produce food and I want to see them um, being productive, being efficient, because of course that's a really good environmental gain, often um, efficiency in farming. And what we're talking about at the moment is providing a range, a menu may be a slightly slip way of describing it, but it gives an understanding, I think, of, 
of what we're doing so that every sort of farmer can engage. So we might well include things like um, cover crops and break crops as, as good things to do for the soil. We might have a series of initiatives about animal health and welfare, um, which could use, could build on existing schemes that already exist. We could, of course, include hedgerows and, and flower margins because we know that those are useful things to have. We could um, look at the way that grassland is managed and, and the sort of leaf schemes which already exist. I'm very keen to engage, well, this is of most benefit if nearly everybody, well, if everybody does it, we will get the most environmental gain. I think it's right, most of your members will be both passionate environmentalists and productive farmers. And I think it's right that we acknowledge that that is the case. But in doing so, we do have to have the odd difficult conversation, for example, we know that 57% of farmland birds have decreased in yours and my lifetime. That isn't great. That's not a record we should be proud of. Anything we can do to increase corn buntings, which are my personal favourite, or lapwings, or within the margins of our farm, I, I don't think that's something that only the extreme environmentalist wants to do. So I think we, we want the full menu, the full range, what I think we can do is learn from each other and learn from experts as to how to farm in a way that can increase environmental benefit. But uh, I hope to reassure I want farms to look like farms that produce food. I, I want them to be recognisably farms. Okay, no, that's great. Um, so final question around Elms and this part of it is that and this is, you know, wearing your lawyer hat, and it may be an unfair question because it is a technical one, is that one of the challenges is a lot of people have said, well, we need to improve the, 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 the payment rates. Uh, the Secretary of State has talked about that, and that sort of income foregone is not enough to really get people, you know, get the, those that really the passionate people on environmental stuff, but not the 95%. Um, and you know, sometimes you, you know, I, I have read that this starts pushing up against WTO rules and the box and stuff. And, and my understanding with no expertise is that it ultimately it will come down to a will, willingness of DEFRA to sort of push the envelope um, because this is stuff you can do, but how does it sit with other departments when we're doing trade deals? Um, and it's just sort of get your sense of that. If you've sort of picked anything up within the department is to have the willingness of the, of of DEFRA to sort of really address that um, payment rates to make it attractive enough for everyone to embrace? Um, well, the good thing about being a lawyer, as well as a farmer, is that uh, lawyers think law um, is there to help people, which is probably not the perception of the general public. So I would start, and DEFRA starts very much from the position that we are proud of our new farming policy. Public money for public goods is a defensible policy. It's a good policy. It is the way that is so much more defensible, truthfully, than the common agricultural policy. And um, this is a good way of providing subsidy to growers of the food that we need to eat. So I think we go in very hard, believing in what we're doing. And I don't personally think, and I have looked at this very closely, that the WTO is going to stand in our way. We're going to have a new relationship with the WTO as an independent member. It's, it is going to take us time to, to find our way. We've, we've gone with the pack and we've been protected by the pack, as it were, for, for 40 years. Um, and it's less legal than political. In, I'm trying not to be rude about the, the way that the system works. But I think it's right that we are fairly bullish about our new policies because they're good and they're defensible and i'm sure that we will manage to uphold them okay thank you well i'm um i'm gonna turn now to um various we've got various questions that have some were sent in before and some on the uh that come come through while we've been speaking um and actually it was one of the ones that i had but i'm gonna credit it to uh john chin um who i um 
I think is a big vegetable producer, farmer, from what I remember in um, sort of Shropshire way. But um, his question is the government's position on gene editing. And I maybe I just add a bit of flavor to that because I'm aware in various briefings that we've been doing in, with, the, with the, the, um, the House of Lords ahead of the Ag Bill that, that there's likely to be an amendment come forward. I know the Prime Minister around the time of the election spoke sort of in favour of using technology and the new gene editing technology, which is very, very different to the, you know, um, what we've seen in the past. I just wondered what your views on it were, embracing that, and government always talks about being led by science. Well, the scientists all think it's brilliant and very exciting, and we as a country should lead with this. And it'll be a, will it'll be a political decision, ultimately. Where, do you, where are you in the department and where do you think um, number 10 is on this? I think me, the department and number 10 and the, our departmental scientific advisor are all in exactly the same place. Gene editing is exciting. Yep. It, it's something we need to explore further. It is something that we can do as a result of Brexit. Mm -hmm. It gives us the freedom not to be bound by that really irritating ECJ judgment which lumped uh, gene editing in with other forms of genetic modification and, and meant that we couldn't move forward in a way that we wanted to. It's something the Prime Minister personally is very excited by. Mm. I hope that we will be able to lead the way on this, to continue to follow the science, obviously carefully, and obviously taking into account the environmental aspects of what we're doing, but I'm really excited by gene editing. In terms of the amendment, we, we, we haven't made a decision at the moment on where the right place to do it is. We are going to have to need some, we are going to need some primary legislative change in order to enable um, gene editing to actually start in a meaningful way. But we will also have to do a consultation because people have very real concerns about this. You'll have seen that well, you, we've talked about the row about standards. We really, really need to do some pitch rolling on gene editing. We do not want this very important matter sidetracked by people who, frankly, don't understand what we're talking about. So I think we need to tread fairly carefully while making positive noises at the same time. So I can't promise you a clause in the Ag Bill. I'm not ruling it out, but I can't promise it. We have other bits of big government legislation coming forward from death. I'm, I'm not suggesting it's going the fisheries bill, but <laughs> we have the environment bill and we will probably have to have further legislation in the next few years. And I hope that we will be able to incorporate it. Okay, thank you. Um, another question sort of on the theme of technology from Martin Collison. We have a large number of migrant workers in, I'm just reading this as it's come in, um, in the food chain. Looking forward, we can't rely on short term measures we have used this year, e.g. the furloughed, st furloughed staff. Will DEFRA commit now to invest in technology we need to replace some seasonal staff with technology so producers have confidence to invest in future production? And maybe linked to that, this whole, you know, the whole broader concept of technology and becoming a more productive sector because there are bits of farming that, are, that have really sort of plateaued for some time. Okay. But a very high level to start with. Yes, absolutely. That is one of the problems with the common agricultural policy. It has not encouraged us to farm as efficiently as I think we would have done otherwise. Um, the, the Secretary of State and I both come from fruit farming backgrounds. Um, so my dad had 11 acres of plums all the time when I was growing up and that was a very big part of my summer, coping with that harvest and, and the direct selling we did. Mm. And um, the Secretary of State comes from a strawberry farming background. So we are both all over the migrant worker discussion in, in the way that you'd expect. It has been very interesting this year how growers have managed to adapt to the unique situation when we seriously could not fly in the, the staff that we've used from Bulgaria and Romania in particular in the last few years. Certainly, um, we grow a lot of asparagus in my constituency and what has happened on the ground has been um, about a third of uh, what we would have referred to before as migrant workers we found actually have settled status in Libya, so they've come anyway. 
about a third have managed to come from abroad and newly this year, first time for about 15 years, we have picked up about a third of British workers. Um, one of my big growers, he's, he's a great man, um, said to me, oh, Victoria, it's like the UN round here on his asparagus farm, but he was embracing it and enjoying it. And he was enjoying using um, the, the, the new workforce, particularly actually um, young women. The, the young men all collapsed on day two, apparently, of picking asparagus, but the young women stuck it out. And he thinks that there are real possibilities there. And of course, it is a more sustainable workforce than um, depending on the economies, frankly, of other countries. In terms of the, the other part of your question, which was about technology, George is extreme, coming from strawberry background as opposed to a, a plum and apple background, which is mine. Um, he's extremely keen on picking technology. I'm, uh, I'm interested, of course I am, but I know it can't do everything. Um, so I want to have a good spread of questions, so totally different question here from Jill Attenborough is around education. Um, would um, the minister support the premise that educational access to farms is a public good, one in its own right worthy of public funding? And I guess maybe you might want to draw it because it's, it's one of the things that Elms talks about, um, education, but also, you know, how we engage with what is a very urban and urban society that we live in. Yeah, it's really, really important. It's actually in the beginning uh, clauses, the most important clauses of the Ag Bill. We've actually enshrined education as something that we can promote and pay for. I am really worried about how far we've got from the land as a society. Um, I hope that one of the net gains of COVID is that people think about where their food comes from. I also, I'm very frustrated, as you all have heard, by the discussion on food standards, but I hope at least it makes people think about what they're eating and where it comes from. We, we've got to get children onto farms. I am very proud. I was, I was talking to Mark earlier about our, our own children and how proud we were of their countryside knowledge, that has not come lightly. And in fact, has been one of the reasons that my husband and I, who, who work mainly off, off the land, have been determined to smallhold and raise animals for the pot at home, because we wanted the girls to understand how that happens. And of course, not everybody has the benefit of a countryside upbringing. Um, I am, my children attended something called forest school, which might sound gimmicky, but actually was fantastic. It just means that you do all your lessons in all subjects outside. That's something I'm very keen on. I was actually talking to the education secretary earlier this morning about things that we can do. But I think it is right that we as farmers engage with the general public. I, we grew on uh, at home some beautiful winter linseed this year. You, you, uh, I wouldn't be a nightmare to harvest, I'm sure, but it was incredibly pretty for about three weeks. And it was during lockdown and of course people were doing their daily exercise and farm walks, uh, even if it's not full time, even if it's just for a few weeks of the year, can be a really good way of engaging with people and open farm Sunday and all the rest of it. Yeah. And we I, need I, to do more. Yeah. And I, I really, well, A, there's some fantastic charities out there doing brilliant work in this space on a shoestring. Um, and actually, I think it's when you talk to farmers, people, farming community wants to do it. I've been involved in a test and trials up here in North London, 50, 60 farms, 53 farmers. And amazing how many of them want to get involved in, in education and, and, and helping, whether it's farm walks or just sort of, you know, they really understand what the problem we've got. Um, I, I think that was the first one, the team, is it the 23 Burns? Yeah, that's right. That, that, that was recommended to me as the first one I had to visit by the Good. test and trials team. So um, well, come I on. clearly think it's worth looking come at. Um, part of, um, you know, maybe it's a bit of a technical question, but around elms, and this is soil, and soil has become, you know, the real, always has been, but it's really come back into the fore of importance. And I know it's on the face of the bill, which is excellent for, from our point of view as an industry. But a question here from Julian Alston. Uh, How will the government benchmark um, 
soil carbon levels as a baseline to reward improvement in carbon sequestration? So now this is a technical question. I wouldn't expect you to know the answer, as I certainly don't. But it is it's very, we all know we need to improve soil, but how we measure it and how we reward people. And ha have you seen anything about how that's starting? Yes. To um, one of my fellow ministers in the department, Rebecca Pau, who's a, who's a good friend, we, we were the two MPs who, who slept in the Farmers Club when we were first elected in 2015. Um, she, her degree was in soil and uh, she is a proper expert and it's always worth engaging with her formally on, on this. Yep. Obviously, I'm interested in soil as, as anybody who grows anything is. Yeah. Um, we do need a, a soil monitoring scheme of some kind which will provide this baseline. That's a discussion that we're having actively in the department and I think I've got a meeting on it very soon. Um, and some of the things I talked about earlier with cover crops, for example, and break crops are, of course, designed to be easy ways, well, I, I don't mean that fliply, um, for all farmers or all growers to engage with um, the health of their soil. There's also the more complicated debate about soil sequestration and, and, and and greenhouse gases, which I think is difficult. It is going to be hard for us to do much more in this space in Britain, I think. Mm -hmm. Certainly our chief scientific advisor tells me that, though, though there is stuff we can do in peatland soil, for example. Um, just to talk more generally, I would hope that soil association accreditation, for example, would be something that we can incorporate in our schemes going forward. So just to give you some idea of how I think they will work, I would hope that if, you're, if your soil is accredited by a recognised body such as that, that that would be a tick in the box, as it were, that would um, show that you were farming in a soil friendly way. Yeah. Okay. So that's a partial answer. I, I'm not really, I'm not really a soil. soil no, no, I, I, I absolutely <laughs> totally me neither. And uh, but but that was very reassuring that it's on the, the focus is there. Um, I've been give, sent a message. I've got seven minutes. I've got two questions I think would be interesting. One that links back to what we were talking about at the start about um, security of food, self sufficiency, and it's from Simon Dixon Smith. Do you consider that maintaining or improving our self-sufficiency in food production is an important strategic objective? Yes, but food security doesn't mean we, we produce 100%. In fact, it really doesn't mean... We, one of the lessons of the pandemic is that if, if we'd all been taken out by COVID at once, as it were, or laid low, we need to make sure that we do have good supply chains from other places. And of course, about a fifth of, of what we eat isn't the sort of thing that was the best one in the world we want to grow in Oxfordshire. I mean, I'm, I'm not taking up spice farming or, or, or rice farming <laughs> uh, where, where we live. Um, so food security, it does not mean 100% local production. I hope though, with Brexit, we can do more in the promoting local produce space. And that's something I'm pushing very hard in the department. It's, it's, it's a bit of a mind shift change because of course we haven't been allowed to for many years to promote British produce in the way that we might have wanted to. But I, I think that is something that we can do going forward and I'm, I'm very, very keen to do. I think there are real, um, you had a horticulturalist ask a question earlier and, and I, I should have said that my family, my farming family originates in the Vale of Evesham and I, uh, in fact, our, our family memoir such as it is, is called Not Only Cabbages read into that what you like but I think there is much more that we could do in the horticultural space and I hope that we will um, going forward but um, we need to realise that farms that food security does mean food coming from a variety of places and that's not a bad thing so I, I in percentage terms I don't want to give you a number we're not in a bad place at the moment yeah. as we've just demonstrated in the pandemic um, but I hope that people will buy good quality British produce because it's delicious. Yeah, I mean, I, I read a fascinating thing, I think it was in the Times last week, talking about security of food, and it was a, 
the, the percentage of, of our fresh veg that we, when we walk yeah. down the supermarket that comes from Spain, I think, I'm, I'll get the number wrong, but I think it was something like 35 or 40% comes and from And Holland. Spain. Yeah. But it's Spain, not so it, different from East Anglia, you might think. Yeah, exactly. But Southern Spain has, a, you know, a couple of water challenges, potentially, if you believe in climate change. And would we, you know, is that, that's quite a big percentage, you know, coming on lorries from an area of the world where they've got some real challenges. Um, I, I think people after the pandemic are genuinely interested in food miles and in where their food comes from. Yeah. and in growing their own. I mean, that's a whole new um, new thing that we're talking about again, which, which has got to be good. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a final question um, from someone not so far from where I'm sitting, in a chap called James Joycey from North Northumberland. Um, and it incorporates two things, um, um, Scotland or the, you know, the, the different um, countries of Great Britain and also um, forestry, which we haven't talked about. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a refreshing interview. Thank you, Minister, for your time and for sharing your views. Could I ask two questions? One, could the Minister perhaps give a word or two on how England and Scotland can work together in the agricultural and food sector? Rightly, we focus on the EU and trade deals, but a word on her relationship with colleagues in Scotland would be helpful in this context. And the second part, and he lives very near the border, which is why he's asking that question. Uh, the second part of the question is, I haven't heard yet the minister mention the word forestry, a sector that comes under her remit. I'm not sure if that's actually true, but I think it may be Lord Goldsmith. Um, is there a role for forestry in England and Wales? So just on that latter point, I think it, even if it isn't under your remit, certainly at CLA, we very much believe that it's land use, whether it's trees, sheep, cows, or wheat, or, or cabbages. And just be interested, the second bit on forestry is how you see that fits together. So, so Scotland and, and Wales, um, you know, we're an England and Wales organisation, um, and there's all sorts of problems. That we're, you know, with, with yeah, it, it is uh, sometimes an uncomfortable situation with the devolved administrations. I'm, we have good relationships, though. I would say that on an official level, we have really superb relationships. COVID has brought us closer. Um, because we've been in crisis mode and we've been feeding people and so I would say that we had warm and I, I mean I'm having a meeting with with both this afternoon just in in that space so I think in a funny sort of way it's been quite a good introduction for a new farming minister because I've had to engage with the devolved administrations from day one and I feel I know the people very well it is however slightly awkward I met the N NFU from Scotland um, just before lockdown and they are frustrated not to be going in, in the same direction as our future farming policy and I very much hope that the Welsh will follow us and that that seems to be the indication. It is it is awkward for border farmers and I met with um, Welsh MPs who represent border farmers last week there are very real differences and difficulties. For example, we were talking about TB and badgers, and badgers, of course, are not respecters of Offa's Dyke. So um, there are, I wouldn't pretend that it isn't sometimes a bit awkward, but we do have to engage with it and engage with it. We will. Um, my mum was Welsh, and uh, I was the uh, uh, the lead person of the, the Reeling Association in Parliament, so I feel close links to both Scotland and Wales and of course Northern Ireland. So I, I, we've got to get on with it and get on with it, we will. Um, on the other part of your question, forestry, of course, sitting in Northumberland, you can hardly forget forestry. I'm sorry we haven't mentioned it so far. Um, I am, uh, uh, if Rebecca Powell is a soil nut, I'm an ancient tree nut. Um, and in fact, uh, my father and I have had, we've always tried to avoid each other in Parliament. We have different names and we try not to bang on about each other, though I have in, I have in this call, I realise. Um, but farming works like that, I'm afraid. It does run through families. Um, uh, the one thing you could always guarantee you'd find both of us at is any event organised by the Forestry Association. It is something, though not in my brief, that um, I feel very, very strongly about, probably more than almost anything. And it's something, as a department, we are very committed to planting the right sort of trees in the right sort of places and really um, changing the face of, uh, of 
a lot of Britain in terms of our tree planting. I think that we have a really big ambition. Whether we quite get there, I, I don't know, but I think we are right to do so. And I look forward to working with all of you further on that. Good. All right. Um, well, Minister, thank you. Well, on trees, though, I think we're going to be, hopefully, the government's tree strategy will be out quite soon, I believe. So we'll know that, that that is a whole other subject for another day. Um, but I'm conscious of time. You have an incredibly busy schedule. Um, and so I'm incredibly grateful for giving us the time for an hour um, and being so frank just weeks, months into your, into your job. Um, and I, I think I'd sort of second what James Joyce said, a very, very refreshing and open and honest discussion. So thank you. No, well, thank you. And, and um, I would like to thank you as well for, for backing us up, if you like, in, in the food standards space. It's right that we have that discussion, but I'd rather people had it accurately. Okay. And you know, what I think what's certainly reassuring for me, I'm sure others, that what came through today was that you know, farming is definitely in your in your in your bones, and uh, you've obviously got a, a good dad to turn to turn to with uh, with all that farming experience. And yeah, even 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 if I said he should retire, you know. <laughs> so thank you very much, and uh, we will look forward to seeing you soon. And and good luck. Thank you very thank much. You. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as Mark said, I think that was a passionate and very clear interview. Um, I hope you enjoyed it uh, and I hope you meet again soon. Uh, please note the next two events coming up. Uh, we've got the industry update on Wednesday 24th June at 2pm uh, and a really interesting interview with Catherine Mead, the owner of uh, uh, Liner D Dairies um, on Friday the 26th of June at 3 p.m. Uh, may I remind you that this session has been recorded and will be available on our website. Thank you very much and have a great day.